Speaking of roots and reminding me of plants, did you see the memorial garden coming along out there? Good job, Tammy, and whoever else came and helped. I don't know who else to, came and helped, but uh, it, I know it's not done yet, but it's going to look nice. So if anybody has any has a shovel and a rake and wants to come over and start raking mulch around, please do, uh, especially after 6 o'clock when it's not so hot that you're going to die. Um, let's see. And... As most of you know, I was gone all week. Um, I went home to Indiana to attend the funeral of my uncle Robert, who passed away last Saturday. Although he had been sick for about a year, his death happened suddenly, uh, unexpectedly, and so the family was hit pretty hard by it. A lot of you have asked, you know, if I was going to officiate the funeral, and the answer was no, I didn't. Um, they have a pastor up there, and he did the funeral which I was grateful for because I got the chance to be part of the family and grieve with the family. Uh, but if you'll humor me for a minute and indulge me, I will tell you a little bit about my Uncle Robert. He died too young, at the age of 66. As soon as he retired last year, he started feeling bad and had very little energy. Only able to get out of bed for short periods of time, mostly just to go to the couch to watch TV, which is very unusual for a person who worked outside his whole life doing landscaping. Uh, it was unusual for him to not have the energy to want to do hard work still. Um, in fact, I suspect that he was probably sick for a while, but he was the kind of guy that just didn't complain about things until it got so bad that he couldn't do anything about it. Um, it turns out that he had non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver. And by the time he caught it, it was just too late to do a lot about it. Uh, he was my dad's best, fr best friend from the time they were 15 years old, and he married my dad's sister, and that's how he became my uncle. Um, he married my dad's sister, Penny, and it was a marriage that lasted 47 years until he died. Uh, my memories of Robert mostly are helping Mariah and I out at our first home. Uh, you know, if anything was broken or needed helping, he could come over and do the handyman stuff that I am neither handy enough nor manly enough to do. And he, he helped me get into the hobby of riding motorcycles. And he and my Aunt, and my Aunt Penny and would also go along with, uh, uh, on motorcycle rides with Mariah and I and my dad before, before Alana was born. And, you know, he was quick-witted, kind of goofy sometimes, but above all, he was always helpful to friends and family, no matter what kind of mess we had gotten ourselves into. And he and my dad had this annoying habit of, even though he died young, don't, don't worry, he did have plenty of fun in his life, and he didn't get to enjoy the environment, but he made sure he had plenty of toys throughout his life, and he and my dad had this annoying habit of Robert would get a motorcycle, so my dad would get a motorcycle, and then my dad would get a camper, so Robert would get a camper, and then they would get a boat, so they would get a boat, and they, four-wheelers, whatever it was, always had toys to play with. And while I was up there remembering Uncle Robert, I saw family and friends that I hadn't seen in a long time. And just like last time I went up, I, I got long tours of uh, country roads and small towns that I hadn't seen in over a decade. And while the towns had grown up quite a bit, the country roads never change. The country roads, as many songs have been written about the country roads. Take me home. Take me home. They're, they're long and windy covered by a canopy from the forest, deer jumping across the street at every curve. Most of the people, just like those country roads, hadn't changed a bit that I met, that I saw. Uh, during the trip, I was reminded of one person who had been fighting addiction for the past 30 years. Um, he had just finished another stint in rehab and he was staying in a halfway house now, and it appears to be a good rehab and a good halfway house, and I'm very grateful for that. But it made me think a lot about the problem of addiction, which is another topic that never seems to change. For those of us that have had a family member who struggles with substances, we know the pains of that struggle and how long-term that battle can be. 
Just like those never ending changing, con excuse me, never changing and never ending country roads, it seems like they will never change, never get better, never find a new path in life. We fear for them as they continue to face the disease of addiction. We watch as they stumble and fall and that their health goes downhill, affected by the chemicals or alcohol that they're putting in their body. They'll never change, we think. And we often resign ourselves and give up on them and wait for a dreaded phone call telling us that their struggle is truly over and that addictions claim their lives. According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, about 72% of people that perceive that they have a problem with, with substances consider themselves to be in recovery or fully recovered from their addiction. 72%, I'll say that again, of people that perceive themselves as having a problem with addiction find themselves to be either fully or partially in recovery. Personally, I find that number a little dubious because it's based on people's own perception rather than any kind of standardized definition of what recovery or addiction means. So it seems kind of unscientific to me. It's quite subjective. Unfortunately, many people who struggle with substances don't believe that they have a problem, which would exclude them from being counted among those numbers of people that perceive themselves to have a problem. Um, in addition, accepting and understanding that you are struggling is a major step toward recovery. So, of course, people that have the self-awareness and insight to perceive that they have a problem are going to have a better chance of doing well in treatment and, and maintaining abstinence or a bare minimum greatly reducing their substance use. However, despite the fact that this statistic doesn't actually capture everyone that's facing the disease of addiction, I still find it pretty darn encouraging. I think we should. I still find it encouraging to hear that almost three quarters of people who recognize their problem with addiction are doing better now. That's a number that gives me hope, but it doesn't match the public narrative about addiction, does it? As most people I talk to seem to believe that recovery rates are very low and that people rarely overcome addiction. Most people, it seems to me, think that people with substance use disorders are hopeless and that they'll never get better. Here's another stat from SAMHSA that's interesting. Upwards of 90% of people who need treatment will never receive it. 90%. There simply aren't enough beds in rehab facilities and they're too expensive and there are too many barriers to people getting there, including problems with limiting, limited coverage from insurance companies and biases, according to, uh, biases of people's skin color and various other things that often present barriers for people to get in. But can you imagine if we had that same stat about any other illness? Say cancer or heart disease, that 90% of people who have it will not receive treatment in our country. Would we as a society find that acceptable? No, we wouldn't. So why is it acceptable with the disease of addiction? That, my beloved community, is what we call injustice. When we talk about injustice, that is what we're talking about. We're talking about people not being treated fairly. If some, even if someone does receive good treatment and support, it typically takes over eight years and multiple attempts and relapses before someone catches on and achieves long-term remission of the disease of addiction. Eight years. Now, in a way, in that way, addiction is similar to some other diseases that we know. That people face with other illnesses, such as multiple rounds of treatment before experiencing remission. I mean, yeah, eight years is a long time to typically receive good remission, but many people facing other diseases face the same kind of thing. Relapses in their disease before they achieve remission. And multiple rounds of different modalities of treatment. The illness is chronic, meaning that it doesn't go away. It takes constant attention and awareness from the person themselves, from professionals, and from friends and family to maintain sobriety. But it can happen. 
And it does happen. No matter what people may say, there is hope. There's quite a bit of it. So why do we cling to a narrative that it doesn't happen? Why do we cling to that? Why do people still, still believe that it doesn't happen, that people don't get better from addiction? Maybe because it's easier. You know, the act of hope takes a lot of work. The act of hope is just that, it's active. It's an art, really. It has to be practiced and not just given lip service. It's been trained out of us, in fact. Let's face it, pessimism sells better. It just does. We pretend that we prefer uplifting messages and that we all like to say that we try and stay positive. But all of you, all you have to do, really, is look on social media or the news or popular TV shows to see what gets the most clicks. News stories that predict wars and the end of the world Facebook posts that directly and intentionally insult half of the people that are reading them. We gossip among each other in the parking lot or around the, around the water cooler about the things we don't like about so-and-so. Constant complaints, but never offering a solution. All of these things serve only to tear down rather than to build up. They divide us rather than unite us. We forget that in the New Testament, it teaches about faith, hope, and love, not greed, fear, and hate. In fact, I would be so bold to argue that most of us are addicts, addicted to negativity, to fear, to naysaying, and we have forgotten the art of hope. And it is definitely an art because it requires a creative spirit and an agile spirit to navigate a world of negativity. But Paul provides us with a remedy in his letter to the Ephesians. In this letter, he says that we all have access to God and to the Holy Spirit, all of us. We're united in that, asp in that access, in fact. That's what unites us. For him, that's the gospel in the end of letter to the Ephesians, is this message of unity because we have all been given free access to God through Jesus Christ. We learned in the past couple of weeks that unity is one of the major themes in, in, Ephes in Ephesians. And one of the ma other major themes is hope. And that's what we read today. He says that working through us, God can do more than we could ever ask or imagine. But we act like we're af almost afraid of that hope. And we are. We're afraid to lay our own wills down and let God take charge and do what we are unable to do for ourselves. And if you know anything about the 12-step program, that probably sounds pretty familiar. Step three. But we're afraid to relinquish control because sometimes it means that we have to submit to being controlled by God. We're like the apostles in John's gospel who are out in the boat and we see Jesus walking towards us on top of the water. And that scares us because that, let's face it, that's not right. <laughs> it's not what we would expect. And it's outside of our control. But Jesus tells the disciples, don't be afraid. It's just me. Don't be afraid. It's just me. When we see something amazing, do we recognize it as just Jesus doing his thing? Are we willing to leave room for Jesus to just do his thing and to amaze us by accomplishing more than we could ever ask or imagine? Or will, will we be the people of hope, the ones who dare to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and dare to hope? The ones who bring good news to the poor and set captives free. The ones who await and actively enact the coming of the kingdom of God. Choose hope. It's not a lost art yet, but it does require some extra work. It requires some navigating around a world that prefers pessimism. It prefers negativity. 
but it's not a lost art yet. Not as long as the people of God with Jesus Christ at the head of the church continue to practice it. So let's practice that together, get better, and practice the art of hope. Amen.